I, I literally heard the tanks rolling very close to us. And that is truly intimidating. I guess this is like the realization of the fact that the life is very fragile. Welcome to the Tony Gebhardt Show. I'll be your host today, Tony Gebhardt. Hey there, my friends. This is Tony Gephardt, and you're listening to the Tony Gephardt Show. First episode of 2024. I know it's been a little while. Sincerely apologize for that. Been in the middle of a big move. However, I'm really grateful to start off 2024 with a really cool friend of mine that I've gotten to know um, over the past couple of months. His name is Alexander Artikov. However, we'll just call him Alex for today. He is from Ukraine, born and raised in Ukraine, completely blind or has a little bit of vision. We'll find out more of his story and currently resides in Sweden. But I just want to be of a warm welcome to Alex into the Tony Gebhard Show studio. How you doing, man? It's good to see you. Hello. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me on. Uh, doing fine. How about awesome. you? Awesome. Oh man, I'm really good. Well, it's I got to say most of the most of the country is freezing to death right now in in America, but here in Southern California it's uh, sunny and 67, so I'm very much enjoying that it's an, uh warm front <laughs> that's coming through. So yes. I, c- I can never stress how I, how jealous I am of you because in Sweden it's also freezing. It's been snowing quite continuously. We we're getting like minus twenty Celsius, which is oh my. I believe minus minus two or something Fahrenheit. So very cold. So being being pretty cold here, yeah. Wow. Oh my goodness. So listen, man, we had talked previously off the cuff about p- bringing you onto the show because you know you were you and I've gotten a chance to know one another through Survive the Wild, and something really sparked my interest about your story um, as you know, a blind person. And for those who are coming to the Tony Gephardt Show for the first time, this platform is to bring people with visual impairments or people with disabilities with an inspiring story or just a twist in their life that has pushed them to do better or to reach for higher heights in their lives. However, in Alexander's case, um, one of the things that uh, really intrigued me was you you had to experience and flee Ukraine during the Russian invasion. Yeah, correct. I mean, I, I can't even imagine the, the heartache and hardship and, and fear that comes with the, uh, the you know, the, the, the inevitability of warfare, but let alone living living blind like you and I and having to, you know, basically get out of your home and just say goodbye, knowing that you may not see that house ever again or see certain people ever again. Yeah, that's truly really heartbreaking. Sure. And um, but tell me, what are you doing nowadays? Are you going to school? Are you going to college? What's what's on your radar? Yeah, I'm going to college. I'm uh, going to college in Stockholm. Uh, it's just called Stockholm University. I'm doing a degree there. So it's like a double degree in uh, English linguistics and political science. Wow. Mm, basically, that's pretty much what's on my radar. Do you see yourself pursuing a career path of politics or you know sociology, working with people? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, maybe like working with people, maybe in a public or private sector, maybe as a scholar, but uh, yeah, definitely wow. in that kind of field of sure. political science and sociology. So I don't want to talk too much about the war because I know that is a touchy and sensitive topic. But what really intrigues me, Alex, is, you know, being that you've seen it, you've seen some elements and aspects of that conflict and how it has impacted the Ukrainian people and those that are, um, especially within the disabled community. What what was going through your head, if you don't mind sharing some of that information 
you know, when you were told, hey, we need to go? Yeah, so uh, first uh, first and foremost, I I guess that would be good to know that I have heard it, not seen it. And it was pretty much the only time <laughs> in my life when I didn't regret, when I did not regret I was blind, you know. Yeah, right, When I was right. kind of in the, in the advantageous position because good humor. I haven't seen good that. Good humor, yeah. I haven't seen that horror. Sure. Yeah. And how is your family? Uh, they're okay, actually. Uh Thank God no one has ever been injured or no one has gotten in any serious trouble. Uh, I am currently in Sweden with my parents. Uh, we had to leave some of our relatives in uh, Ukraine because uh, my grandparents, they're pretty old. They're almost unable to move, but we got someone taking care of them there. Oh, and good. They're doing, they're doing fine. Oh, good. Good. Now, right now, with with things where they are and and where they started and what feels like a century ago now because it feels like this conflict's just been going on for since we anyone can remember um yeah have you been back to ukraine since you left no not really my father no. has okay and when when looking at it do you do you still have friends that live in ukraine mm, yeah a few of them uh, mainly in the safer areas of the country, in the safer regions. Sure. Uh, those uh, who were from my city, they have they have fled the country as well because it is pretty dangerous to stay where I am from and where I was living. Sure. Now, I'm, I want to ask you for an opinion um, on the show today. And if you decline to answer, that is totally okay. We can just edit this part out. But from your opinion, Alex... You know, you're pursuing political science. You're pursuing English linguistics. So you've you've got a heavy interest in in the art of politics or in the art of how people operate on such a level. What's your opinion of this conflict? So uh, actually, the conflict has been going on for way longer than it seems to pretty much everyone outside of Ukraine or Russia. It's been going on since... Uh, early 2014 and it's been slowly kind of developing just imagine someone has a cancerous tumor and it's not yet detected but it's still developing like deep down in their body and uh in 2022 it just uh it just exploded it just it it, it kind of took a serious turn uh there, there began a new chapter of that conflict but yeah so just speaking historically and um, just from what I've seen being a Ukrainian and living through that, even before everyone sure. knew of that conflict, I would say that, yes, it is uh, It is 99% Russia's aggression and the ambitions of a Russian dictator who is trying to resurrect the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire. He is actually changing his rhetoric here and there. So it's not exactly clear what kind of purpose he is pursuing. But yes, so he's trying to just conquer the mm -hmm. land which which might be beneficial to him. Now Through, let me ask you and, Yeah. Oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just saying that the methods of this conquest and this invasion are truly despicable and it is actually far from the way you would imagine the war back in the day, because it is it's just killing civilians, destroying the like you know residences, and uh, basically what what they're targeting is oftentimes far from any sort of military objects that 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 it could be worth for them to target. They're specifically targeting the civilian houses and the, you know, residency areas to just uh, kind of frighten the population. And, Would you uh, consider what Russia's aggression has been doing? Because as we, as we all know, a lot of the time during invasions from from different foreign affairs and and, and different conflicts, right? We've seen that. A lot of the time, the opposing aggressor 
will attack military structures, will attack specific buildings of significance. Would you consider what Russia has been doing to Ukraine to be a war crime? Yes, and not only me, it's been considered by a countless amount of courts, uh, like international courts in Europe and even in the States, uh, as far as I'm aware. And yeah, it is truly a war crime mm. because uh, they they do not always target the significant buildings. As, as I noted above, they're specifically targeting the resident areas and uh, schools and hospitals. and People uh, who had nothing to do with this. People... Yeah, people who have nothing to do with that and people who can't really escape the situation because, for example, if there is a, say, like a uh, facility for wheelchair-bound people or for people with any other disabilities and they target it, these people have just no way out, None. right? Yeah, helpless, you know, left left in, in such a vulnerable position. Wow. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing you know, your insight into it, because, you know, I, I can't even imagine the the fear that many people have felt and experienced during such a tasteless and fruitless invasion, um, you know, in, in addition to all of this. But I mean, it, do you do you feel so here poses the question, given your survival and the success that you, your family and those around you that you love so near and dear the, that you've been able to uh, uh, attain, have you felt any survival's guilt for being able to get out? Do you wish that you could help yeah. others? Uh, yes, I do. And I'm actually helping by uh, donating to private funds to the people that I know, to the families that I know that have some uh, relatives in the war, uh, I donate some significant, I hope significant amounts, amounts of money to them so that they could uh, hopefully survive as well as I did. Uh, so that's, for any, I guess. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I guess I would have this survival's guilt if I didn't do anything. But right. I, uh, I kind of compensated by donating money to people who are dear to me to some extent, who I have known for some time, and who I know that also require help mm. as much as never before. So let's talk about that. Now, can you provide for anybody who is listening who may be intrigued and would like to help in more of a private sector, more in a you know direct to... Ukraine support and response, are there any resources or specific charities that you've found to be authentic and, and helpful that maybe listeners can take advantage of? Uh, well, I wouldn't really think of any sort of charity fund, but it, these are rather just my friends and my family's friends, like sure. card numbers and just uh, some bank uh, accounts. Sure. Or send money to, uh, because like all the charity funds, if you um, uh, if you enter any sort of like bank of Ukraine, whatever bank it is, they would offer you a few options where you can donate. But uh, we never know where this money goes. Right? No, we don't. Like, we, we don't. Like right. when, we, we we never we can never trace this money. We can never trace the way of this money. So. And uh, I don't tend to trust these funds too much. And that's because I, th that's why I do the just, you know, private transactions, private donations to the people that I have at least talked to once or seen or known by any other means. And it's more personal that way. It's more impactful. Yes. You know, that money is yes. going directly to their account and not being, you know, uh, uh, taken by you know here here i'm gonna take five percent be just because you know what i mean like you yeah know, but, that's not but by the people who this money is not meant for yeah exactly wow so let me ask you this you know anybody who experiences right anybody that has you know has to be forced in some shape or form to experience such a, a traumatizing shift in their lives you know always learn we always learn something 
as we navigate through. We learn something about people. We maybe we learn something about ourselves or the people around us. What do you feel like has been the most eye-opening perspective or philosophy that you've taken from that invasion from 2022? I guess this is like the realization of the fact that the life is very fragile. It could be taken away from you at any point and you never know. And uh, as long as you're living, as long as you're doing relatively fine, you need to thank whoever you believe for each lived moment and uh, that you're still alive, that nothing has happened. Because it uh, it happened all of a sudden. No one quite expected I mean... People do. Uh, people did anticipate it to some degree, but it just struck the entire country. We just mm -hmm. woke up one morning, and uh, m m actually, my dad woke me up, and uh, he told me that the war had started, and I heard the explosions as I woke up, and that's like from that point forward, my life could have been taken away at any second, at all. So I guess you just realize the total, you know, you, heard you just the tend explosion. to appreciate, you just tend to appreciate the fact, like the sheer fact that you're alive mm. and the fact that you continue living and you continue achieving whatever goals you have, or at least pursuing the goals, just continue being here, not on the other side. Man, you inspire me. That That is absolutely fascinating. And, for, you know, I just, I want to say to thank you for, you know, just, just sharing your story, but also I'm grateful to know you and your family are alive and are healthy and managed to escape unscathed uh, during a moment where, as you said, it, at any moment, you could have been wiped off the face of the planet. No questions yeah. asked. Yeah. Life is a delicate thing, as as you so articulately say. And, and um, Alex, I think we're going to wrap things up, but I want to say thank you again for telling a little bit of your story, but also sharing a sensitive topic from a firsthand experience. We know a lot of us, especially here in America, don't get to truly understand the severity of 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 third world or second world warfare and what the impact that has on a society or a civilization or an economic structure and what that can do and you know knowing that that you can tell that story that you can share that perspective and you know and bring bring light to an otherwise darker subject can really help change people and, and, and diminish the ignorance that separates a lot of people. Yeah. So, uh, I just want to go back slightly. Like I mentioned, I heard the explosions and you, you repeated that phrase. So maybe you just want to hear a little bit of insight about that or, you know, it, it, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I, I do. Um, depending on you know how how much you want to talk about that you know um and we can we can as i mentioned earlier i i the only reason why i'm being sensitive is because i want to be respectful but depend uh on whatever you feel comfortable talking about you know what talk about that day okay yeah because i've, I've actually given like countless interview Oh my gosh! That. Please, and yeah. Then, in, in that case, please talk. Since, tell us to walk since, us through. Since, walk since us it through. happened, since it happened, it's been a a long while now, and my memory is not as fresh and sharp as it was like back back in the day. But so the first day was um, actually I I'm a swimmer as well, so I'm a member of the national Ukrainian team. And at that time, I was, I was having a training camp in uh, one of the smaller towns of uh, 
like in the eastern side of the country as well, maybe like 100 miles away from my home. And uh, my mom was home at that time. Um, so it, just, it was Thursday that I remember for sure. It was Thursday, February the 24th. And uh, my dad woke me up. And at first, I thought that I had overslept my training because uh, we were there with my dad. He was helping me with uh, swimming as well because he is my second coach. He's employed. And uh, he woke me up and I thought I had overslept. So I thought the day would start as always, like business as usual. We just go to have a training, go back, rest, go to have another training. And that's pretty much where the day would end was the with a good dinner. But the day wasn't off to a good start. And he told me that the war had uh, started, that it's rampant, that our that his wife, my mom, called me and uh, called for us to go home because obviously she was extremely frightened to be alone at that kind of hard time. So... And uh, as I said, the explosions were everywhere. So I heard them from like afar. And uh, that wasn't really, that wasn't really kind of fearful because they were very far. But as we drove up to my city, that's where more action was going on. And that's when we heard explosions, some alter, uh, artillery bombarding as well. And uh, we, we literally had to hide in our houses. It was like a cellar, but we rearranged it into some sort of bunker just for, you know, safety purposes and in hopes that if, if there is a strike close to where we were, that it w wouldn't hit us too bad underground. So that was our hiding place. That was our shelter. Um, yeah, so co constant explosions all the time, constant, um, you know, like tanks. I, I, I literally heard the tanks rolling very close to us, and that is truly intimidating. So, also, we were constantly reading news as to like what was going on in our city in other areas trying to figure out what to do was like there a moment to... i i have to ask yeah. was there a moment during during all of those explosions and in, in that time where you had, you mentioned that you heard the tanks rolling by where you thought oh my god I'm, i might die yeah that was when the planes started flying like you know the military planes yeah when they uh started dropping bombs on some infrastructure of our city and when those planes were flying literally over our heads that's that one was the most dangerous moment i guess at all because that's literally when we could have died because the bomb could have dropped anywhere on on its way we could have never predicted where it would drop so yes at what point did you finally take refuge outside of ukraine how how long before the day until you and your family were able to safely escape ukraine uh okay so uh, can you still hear me well yes you sound great okay okay cool so uh i guess that was like when we were a week and a half in Wow. That's when, I guess that's when a lot of planes really started flying and the situation began to deteriorate severely. That's when we realized we had to take refuge because that wasn't really, that was just unbearable to stay there any longer. Now, does, does Sweden... My my geography is uh, a little inept, so you might have to help me out. Does Sweden border Ukraine? Oh no, not really. No, okay. It's it's very far. So where where did you go first, Poland? Because I I know Poland, yes. I I believe. Um, 
borders Ukraine. Yes, so we uh, we had to escape on a train that was uh, specifically prepared for people with disabilities, and which which was organized by my school, which I had graduated from by that point. But yeah, so the train was organized by my school. Since my aunt and uncle, they're also blind, and they also went to that school back in the day, they invited us all to get on that train and flee because that was like the only way i'm not sure how we could have done that like how else we could have done that if it wasn't for them right so yeah we we first we took a uh 24 hour train ride all the way to the western side of our country then we took a bus to poland yeah so the poland was our first country wow does your family still talk about this does your family still occasionally bring it up as a as a reflective piece during a meal or 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 a a conversation at family get togethers or in times yeah, of reflection is this still a conversation they, yeah they keep closely following the news feeds and uh we we keep talking about it especially when something happens especially when you know, there is any improvement or like worsening of the situation. Sure. We, of course, talk about it a lot. Well, Alex, I don't want to take any more of your time. I know it's late over there, but just to close out for today, um, what, what other advice would you want to share, especially to those who may not may not understand war and warfare or maybe advice for those who are still experiencing the heartache of, of conflict. Mm, that would be hard to give any advice in that situation, because this is the situation where you don't have too many options, but I would say just develop some kind of resistance to to what's surrounding you like be just be sure that there is always a way out there is always a beam of light that is in the distance but you're getting closer and closer to it wow amazing well alexander thank you very much for your time today and, and thanks for just shedding light on a sensitive topic um that many are still still trying to navigate right now. And um, again, blessings to you and your family for being able to escape and uh, good on you for continuing your support to those in the uh, beautiful nation of Ukraine. So thank you again for today. And I hope we can have a follow-up conversation at some point to check in. Uh, this is the Tony Gephardt Show. Thank you guys for checking the episode out. Don't forget to leave some feedback on Spotify. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Hey guys, this is Tony Gephardt, and I just want to say thank you for checking out today's episode of the Tony Gephardt Show. And I want to invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash mrjt1020 or you can just search tony gephardt on youtube i post daily motivation youtube shorts original music and other fun content that i'm sure you will enjoy please come join the community and help me reach a thousand subscribers thanks again and remember you're loved and you matter